Hello guys, this is Adip. Welcome to my channel Movement Science, where I create videos to make biomechanics simple. Today's video, I am going to talk about ACL ligament of the knee joint. Let's get started. In this video, we are going to talk about ACL that is the anterior cruciate ligament of the knee joint, its attachments, its parts that is the anterior medial band and the posterior lateral band. We'll also talk about primary and secondary restraint. So to begin with, ACL that is the anterior cruciate ligament is attached on the medial aspect of the lateral condyle of the femur. So this is the medial aspect of the lateral condyle of the femur and it travels anteriorly and on the tibia, it attaches to the intercondylar eminence over here. So now that we know its attachments, let's move on to the parts of ACL. ACL has AMB that is the anterior medial band and PLB that is the posterior lateral band. Anterior medial band becomes taut in flexion and it prevents anterior translation. Anterior translation that is the primary restraint of ACL and posterior lateral band prevents anterior translation in extension that is posterior lateral band becomes taut in extension. Both the ligaments are comparatively lax at 30 degree of knee flexion and at 30 degree of knee flexion there is maximum anterior translation of tibia on the femur. So to demonstrate this there is a graph which I'll show you. In this graph, you can see that the purple line is the anterior medial band's line and the red one is the posterior lateral band. This is the degree of flexion and this is the amount of strain on the ligament. If you see at minus 10 degree of flexion, posterior lateral band has a very high strain. That is minus 10 degree is hyperextension. And as you start flexing the knee, the amount of strain keeps on reducing and by the end of the flexion, the amount of strain on the posterior lateral band is very less. Whereas for anterior medial band at 100 degree of flexion, there is a larger amount of strain which keeps reducing as you go towards the extension. If you see at 20 to 30 degree of knee flexion, both the ligaments have comparatively very less strain on them. And at this degree of flexion, there is comparatively larger anterior translation of tibia on the femur. Now going to the secondary restraint, ACL prevents valgus and varus forces and it also prevents medial and lateral rotation. So in short, if you would like to give an analogy for ACL, it would be the nice guy. Why? Because it goes to stabilize the knee joint in every direction. It prevents anterior translation, it prevents valgus and varus forces as well as medial and lateral rotation. I would like to demonstrate this in the model. So if you see this is the femur and this is the tibia. ACL is attached over here anteriorly to the tibia and posteriorly to the femur on the medial aspect of the lateral condyle. So now if you see, ACL prevents anterior translation. If I try to pull, I cannot pull the tibia because it is attached over here like this. So anterior translation is prevented by ACL. It also prevents valgus and varus stresses. So if I fix my femur and try to move tibia in either direction, you can see ACL prevents, ACL prevents valgus and varus forces. Also, it prevents medial and lateral rotation. So if I try to rotate my tibia, you can see the rotation is also prevented by the ACL ligament. ACL tries to stabilize the knee joint in every direction and hence we call it the nice guy. But as we all know, nice guys always finish last. And hence ACL injury is very commonly seen in our clinics. Women are three times more prone to have ACL injury than men. Do you know why? 
It is because of the small size and shape of the intercondylar notch at which the ACL attaches. Also the other reasons are wider pelvis that increases the Q angle. So women have wider pelvis and hence the femur is more medially angled which increases the Q angle. Q angle is the angle formed by the line passing through the tibia and through the patella vertically and the line passing through the patella joining the ASIS. The angle formed between them is the Q angle. In women, the Q angle is very large. Other reasons for ACL injury is ligament laxity due to hormonal imbalance and also it is seen that quadriceps are very dominant in females and we all know that quadriceps causes anterior translation of the tibia which will stress the ACL ligament. So now that we have learned about the primary and secondary restraint, let us know about the mechanism of injury. Obviously anterior translation will cause lot of strain on ACL and can lead to tear of ACL ligament. But when there is combination of movement that is anterior translation with valgus and medial rotation, it is a deadly combination and ACL often gets injured in such conditions. I would like to explain this through a diagram. So as you can see, if the athlete is weight bearing on his left foot and if the knee goes for valgus, there will be internal rotation of the femur as you can see and lateral rotation of the tibia. Hence at the knee joint there will be external rotation. Also the athlete will be weight bearing on this leg. Hence even though if the knee is in flexion there will be eccentric activity of the quadriceps over here which attaches to the tibia. And when there is eccentric activity of quadriceps, quadriceps will naturally pull the tibia forward in anterior direction and this all the forces that is the medial rotation of the femur, lateral rotation of the tibia and anterior translation of the tibia will together cause tear of the ACL. As you all know that ACL is attached to the medial side of the lateral condyle and to the anterior part at the intercondylar eminence of the tibia. A medial rotation of femur will take the attachment of the femur further away from the ACL and lateral rotation of tibia will take the other attachment of the ACL further away and also the anterior translation will cause lot of stress on the ACL and hence ACL will end up having a tear. 70% of the mechanism of injury is non-contact injury whereas 30% is the direct contact injury. Now let us discuss about the active structures that prevent anterior translation and also cause anterior translation. Those are basically the enemies and friends of the ACL. So the enemy of ACL will cause anterior translation hence stressing the ACL whereas friend of ACL would be one which prevents anterior translation hence supporting ACL. So to begin with hamstrings which are on the posterior aspect over here attached to the tibia and also the fibula but the important part is the tibia and they prevent the anterior translation because when they contract they pull the tibia behind and cause posterior translation. The other muscle which helps to prevent anterior translation is the soleus. So over here you can see soleus is attached to the Achilles tendon at the bottom and superiorly it is attached to the tibia. So when soleus contracts again it will pull the tibia posteriorly. Whereas the enemy of ACL that causes anterior translation is quadriceps which is present on the anterior aspect of the femur and attaches to the tibia in front when this contracts it will cause extension of the knee and as we all know from concave convex rule when the concave surface is moving on a convex surface the glide and the roll is in the same direction hence there will be anterior translation of the tibia so these are the quadriceps and these are the hamstrings the second enemy of acl would be gastrocnemius 
so gastrocnemius is again attached to achilles tendon over here at the bottom and superiorly it is attached to the femur so now that we know the active structures which help the acl and also go against the acl these should be applied in our clinical treatment so i would like to mention two important points which will help in application of active structures that help and go against the acl in the clinics when we start off with the rehabilitation we should always avoid dynamic quadriceps exercises that is when patient is in sitting position and he takes his foot up like this why is this because when he is in sitting there will be quadriceps contraction and it will put lot of stress on the acl ligament as it will cause anterior translation of the tibia second application would be mini squats that is going up to 90 or less than 90 degree of flexion while doing squats so if you see in squats also there is quadriceps contraction but we still give mini squats to a acl patient and avoid dynamic quadriceps for acl patient why is this in both the exercises we can see quadriceps activity but in mini squats what happens is the patient is in close kinematic chain that is he is in contact with the ground hence along with his quadriceps hamstrings will also be working this is called as co contraction when quadriceps and hamstrings are working together quadriceps will cause anterior translation of tibia whereas hamstrings will cause posterior translation of tibia hence the acl will not be strained as much this is a good exercise to strengthen your quadriceps as well as hamstrings also the patient will be weight bearing on his legs so it is overall a really good exercise to start with in rehab process so to summarize we talked about the parts of the acl that is the anterior medial and posterior lateral band we talked about the attachments we covered the primary and the secondary restraint of the acl and also we discussed why women are more prone to acl injuries then we talked about the active structures that cause anterior translation and prevent anterior translation and discussed about their applications in clinics we also talked about the mechanism of injury that is the medial rotation of the femur and lateral rotation of the tibia which puts stress on the acl ligament that's all for today guys thank you if you like my content please share it with your friends don't forget to hit that subscribe button and also let me know in the comment section what other videos you would like me to cover thank you for watching i never made it but i know i did take some motivated by a mix of emotions